Okay, Peter, so I just wanted to really review 2020 today, you know, just talk back through all the things we've talked through this year. And in a way, you could encapsulate the story of this year by the fact that I'm sat in an empty gym wearing my vest. I'm just about to have a workout because the gym is shut because we're now moved into tier four. So we've been open and shut, we've been open and shut. But, you know, the pandemic did play a big part in the story of boxing this year, obviously. But I think, you know, there were actually quite a few positives to come out of that, you know, which, which I'll go through in a bit. But to start off with the year, um, you know, I think we were all full of high hopes, obviously, with the Joshua Avenging Ruiz at the end of 2019. We came into 2020, you know, thinking this 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 heavyweight story is going to be put to bed, maybe. And the first or well, the next step in that is, is obviously Wilder Fury for their response. So that was a bit of a high point at the start of the year when none of us really ever heard of Corona. And I just want to recap on what an amazing performance that was. You know, I mean, I think for me, it was you know, probably one of the performances of the year, certainly the performance of the year by a British fighter. I call it the performance of the year and not the fight of the year because it was a one-sided domination, you know, which we really weren't expecting. It wasn't necessarily a fight which we, where it was going one way and then the other way and lots of different things were happening. And the amazing thing is, to, you know, to recap on that, um, you know, we all say now we think with this distance of time, it's a fait accompli, you know, Fury is a much better fighter. But coming into that fight, a lot of people were thinking maybe there's a possibility of Fury on points if he doesn't get tagged, otherwise it's a wilder KO. What none of us saw coming was what happened. And the weird thing is, none of us saw it coming, even though Fury kept telling us that was what he was going to do. He surprised us all when he did what he told us he was going to do. Because don't forget, coming into that fight, you know, he had that miracle resurrection at the end of the last fight. But, you know, that also means he was just a, a second away from being stopped. So, um, you know, and he didn't really look like he was troubling Wilder massively, apart from in the, in the last round straight after that. So we were thinking it's very dangerous for Tyson. Then he changed trainers really close to the fight. He got rid of Ben Davidson and brought in Sugar Hill Stewart. We thought this is a bad move to change trainers, you know, so close to the fight. Um, and then he weighed in quite heavy, you know, much heavier than the first fight. So we were thinking, look, this is really not looking good. And then he came out and he pushed Wilder back. He beat him up. He mauled him. He dragged him around. You know, he knocked him down. He knocked him down again. Knocked him, you know, it was just, it, it was an amazing, competent, complete, dominating performance uh, from Fury. And then, so then we thought, well, this is, this is incredible. You know, this is, this is really going to be a great year for boxing now. We're going to settle this Joshua thing and we're all going to get it on. And then boom, shut down. So early March, you know, I think it took a lot of us by surprise, it took me very much by surprise. I mean, I think a couple of days before people were saying to me in the gym, do you think it's going to be shut down? I said, no, they won't shut it down. You know, obviously shows what I know. Drove home on the Friday, I think it was the 20th of March. Somebody called from the gym and said they just announced uh, they're going to shut gyms. And then on the 23rd, we went into full lockdown. The following Thursday, I always remember the, the headline of Boxing News, it just said shut down. And there was nothing to report. There was nothing going on. The, all, the, you know, all the shows had, had, had finished. Uh, no crowds permitted. And so we were in a bit of a wasteland, really. You know what I mean? The guys at Boxing News did very well, you know, went through recapping over old things. We were all watching old fights on YouTube. But and we kept thinking, you know, it'll come back soon. It'll come back soon. It'll come back soon. And then it became apparent that this was a long term thing. Crowds were not going to come back. And so everybody started thinking about how to get around this. And uh, Bob Aaron was the first person to come out. So literally m nothing from March to June. I think June the 8th. Bob Aram did the first bubble show um, in Las Vegas. So by bubble, I mean no crowd and, you know, various um, anti-corona measures. And he put that show on. And do you know what, Peter? It was OK. But to be honest, it was a bit of a rehash of what we'd had. Obviously, the, the no crowds made a bit of a difference. What I mean by that is it was a house fighter and an opponent and the house fighter won. It was a formula that maybe, you know, had been working in boxing and we'd often criticised in boxing, but it really didn't work behind closed doors. Or I didn't feel it did. Um, Anyway, then Frank Warren came back. Nice show with BT. So he was the first British promoter to break ground with that with that show. And then we had Eddie Earns fight camp the week after in the summer. The fight camp, four consecutive weekends of boxing in the Matchroom Mansions Gardens in Brentwood, Eddie's childhood home. Um, and, you know, he's very lucky to have that facility. And that was incredible. It was brilliant. It was a showcase for boxing. And I think it brought to the fore some of the positives that we can take out of this pandemic. Um, because that was four consecutive weekends of boxing in the gardens of the Brentwood Mansion. The stories for me were 50-50 fights, which we all say we want and we never get. And I was saying that wasn't on that first Aram show. There were lots of 50-50 fights coming through because people were desperate to get out. They were desperate to fight. And so they weren't really picking and choosing the opponent so much. Um, the rise of women's boxing, I thought, was a massive thing this year. And, you know, that was kind of going to happen anyway, because 
you know, we've said the depth of talent in women's boxing has been coming through. These, these, these ladies have now come through the Olympics, come through the amateurs, you know, have a good pedigree and then coming up into the pros. Um, but they weren't getting the sort of attention that they maybe deserved. And then all of a sudden, Eddie, who's been a bit of a pioneer of this in the UK, put a lot of them on the fight camp, a lot of women's boxing on the fight camp. And all of a sudden, we couldn't look anywhere else. As fight fans, you had to look at this. And so all of a sudden, I think a lot of people's eyes were open and they were like, this is incredible. You know, you look at Katie Taylor having a rematch with um, Del Pasoon, you know, non-stop action, you know, what a fight. Really the most eagerly anticipated rematch we've ever had in women's boxing. You know, there were other real breakthrough stars like Terry, Terry Harper, Natasha Jonas, uh, you know, to, to name a few. And, and, and you just saw the depth of talent across women's boxing, how strong it was in the UK and how good it was. You know, the talent was there, the, the, the skill level was there. And that was really showcased, um, you know, where nobody could ignore it on fight camp. And I think, you know, that, that, that again, that's one of the great success stories of 2020. And then also on fight camp, I think, you know, you started to have this 50-50 fight thing come through. I mean, I've got to say for me, the fight of the year was on the first fight camp. When I talk about fights, you know, like I say, I always say a fight is a fight which goes back and forth and you've got to think about what goes on. And um, Sam Eddington against Ted Cheeseman delivered that for me. And that to me, that took me as a boxing fan, you know, back to the small halls that we've been missing since March. You know, it was like sitting in the York Hall, watching two guys that really want it, really go for it. You know, it wasn't the consummate skill levels that you see of Canelo, who, you know, I mean, you know, we had that consummate performance Canelo at the end of the year, like we had that consummate performance from, from uh Fury that I've already talked about at the start of the year, they bookended the year, but this to me in the middle of it was the fight of the year for me personally, Eddington and Cheeseman, it was just one way then the other way, one was staggered, they came firing back, it was great, and obviously Cheeseman edged that in the end, um, and, and, and what a great way to open fight camp, then we had the success story of the women's boxing, and then we kind of finished fight camp with Povetkin White, the last fight, and remember what the last punch of fight camp was, it was that left uppercut from Povetkin, which completely discombobulated um, White, who up until then was looking like he was dominating that fight. And, you know, when we looked at this, Peter, um, you know, when we previewed it, I did pick White to win, but I said it's going to be a very hard fight. Don't underestimate Kovetkin. People always do, and they come unstuck. You know, we've been saying that Kovetkin's coming to the end of the line for quite a while now, and he never does quite seem to. And it was just, it was an amazing punch to watch. It was just the way he just balanced pivoted on his left foot slightly, White, you know, waited for that opening, White through that right hand and then straight up the middle. And, you know, White didn't know what had hit him and neither did we. So that, that was that was incredible. And, 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 and I think that was also a story. People call that an upset. I don't think it was an upset because we always called it as a hard fight. The bookies called it as an upset. And if you look at what happened in this year, you know, as well, as we got going a pace uh, with these fights, like I say, 50-50 fights came out. Joyce Dubois, to me, that was a 50-50 fight, even though people were leaning on, on Dubois. So they, people saw that as an upset. Um, you had Yard Arthurs, uh, Lyndon Arthurs at the end of the year. Okay, maybe that was a little bit of an upset. Yard was very heavily fancied for that. Um, and then, of course, you know, one of the great uh, fights of the year, uh, Lomachenko Lopez. But if you look back through all those fights, they're well-matched fights. They're great fights between guys who are, you know, at the same stage of the game. Uh, and they're really what boxing fans want to see. And, you know, people were saying they were upsets because... Normally, when the book is picked, they know, know they know who's going to win. Because they were more 50-50, you know, we didn't know who was going to win. And I mean, you know, that, that Lomachenko Lopez really stands out and deserves specific mention because that was an incredible performance. For me, that was, you know, really the, the performance of the year, the international fight. For, 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 for Lopez to do that at such a young age, against such a consummate performer, you know, as Lomachenko, against such a thinking fighter to dominate him for those early few rounds, um, you know. And, and funny enough, trade people were saying... Um, that this was, you know, this was a Lopez. They were calling for Lopez. Remember, we had uh, Willie Monroe Jr., um, you know, talking to us on on this show, um, and he was saying, "No, go for Lopez, man. Too big, too strong. Too, you know, I've been seeing him in the gym. He looks amazing." But outside of that, everybody was going Lomachenko and saying it's too early for Lopez. You know, he's not going to be able to compete with the skill level. But as it was, you know, that was a big breakout fight for him, and great to see, and also great to see that that could be put on that level of fight could come through during this pandemic when we had no. Um, you know, no no ticket sales really to speak of. I mean, crowds started to come back. There were 12,000 people in a 75,000 seat stadium um, at the end of the year for Canelo Smith. Um, there were 1,000 people um, in Wembley Arena for, for Joshua Pulev. So the crowds have started to come back. So there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel, you know, as we all have with, with, this, uh, with, the, with this vaccine. Um, 
But, you know, and, and that covers part of the story. But another big part of the story of boxing this year, which I haven't covered at all, is what happened to the, the, the small hall shows, what happened to the amateur shows, what happened to the white collar shows. Well, there was nothing. You know, it was devastating uh, for all those scenes because they rely almost exclusively on ticket sales for their revenue. And so, you know, they, 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 they were, they were, there were some elite amateurs boxing behind closed doors. Um, you know, there was there was pretty much there, there was very little small hall boxing. They couldn't really, you know, without the without the ticket revenue, they couldn't do a lot. Um, there was only one white collar behind closed door show that I know about, and that was here. So we managed to pull that off, off on October the 31st, and that was great. Um, you know, so we, we put on a really good white collar show there, and amazed at the numbers. And this shows the appetite that's out there for boxing. You know, like look at the people that watched Fight Camp, and and let's like say that was a great. Um, way to jump women's boxing to the fore and we saw all these 50 50 fights come out which i think stimulates people's interest in these fights as well and we put this behind closed door, door show and we thought well who's going to watch you know because people aren't going to come down with their mates and all that sort of thing well are they going to watch at home what's how's it going to be like we got 10,000 views across 103 countries i was amazed i was absolutely amazed and the reason i called up the the international viewing figures Peter, because somebody said to me oh my my, my uncle's watching on a bar in spain Somebody else said to me, I've got some friends in Belgium who are going to watch. I thought, great, well, it'd be interesting because we can finally put the tag international or global, almost as a joke on, you know, if, if we get somebody watching in a bar in Spain or in a bar in Belgium. And it turned out we were watched by 10,000 people across 103 countries, the UK being number one, US being number two. So that was just phenomenal. It shows the appetite that's out there, you know, if you deliver a good quality show. And uh, yeah, so, so, you know, overall, I've got to say, I think Box did quite well in 2020. I think considering, considering, I know it devastated, like I say, large parts of the industry, but we managed to come through, like I said, that, you know, the guys at Boxing News carried on. When the fights came back, they had to be imaginative, think outside the box. And I think Eddie did it best with Fight Camp, um, you know, and it brought women's boxing to the fore. I think it brought 50-50 fights more to the fore. Um, so, you know, I think it was, you know, those were positive things to take out of what, you know, could have been absolutely devastating. So where does that leave us looking forward into 2021? Well, I mean, I think the thing is, we've got to be realistic about this. I mean, you know, like everybody else, I've become a disease expert watching Facebook and everything else. But realistically, it looks like, you know, if you're super, super optimistic, we might be able to do something with crowds in the spring, but more likely we're looking at the summer, um, you know, before the crowds come back. And that means before amateur boxing can properly restart before white, you know, white collar boxing can properly restart before um, small hall boxing can properly get going again. And I think there's a lot of pent up demand, you know, out there. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's going to, when it does come back, it's going to be great. And I think we're really going to appreciate it again. And hopefully we'll take this, the women's boxing and the 50-50 fights that we've seen, you know, how that stimulates interest, you know, into those arenas and, and, and those things will come up and we'll be, we'll be stronger for being away. Um, you know, movements on, on the scene. I mean, obviously, we've got the, the big one we're all looking forward to. We were looking forward to it, funnily enough, at the start of last year. We're looking forward to it at the start of next year. So we want to see um, Fury against Joshua. The thing is with that, you know, if we can't bring the crowds back into Wembley and we can't have 80,000 people in Wembley, then it may go to Saudi, who will pay a £100 million site fee. Um, you know, so that, 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 I think, is maybe the more likely thing for the first fight. Because don't forget, this will be at least two fights. Um, so that fight, we may see the return of Wilder, but he still, still seems to be out in the wilderness. Canelo's going to be interesting. You know, he's got Triple G out there. We've picked Billy Joe Saunders at Cinco de Mayo, um, you know, as, as, as his, his not, maybe not his next opponent, but his opponent in May. So, I, you know, I think that's going to come to pass. That's just a little prediction we're chucking out there. Um, but, you know, I think, I think the future's bright. I think the future's rosy for boxing. I think it's coped with the pandemic as well as it could. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, like I say, it's, it's given us a lot of um, things to come on with next year. I mean, the other thing to think about outside of the fighters and the promotional size, the zone are coming to the UK um, at the start of next year. And that's going to be an interesting development because the zone are saying they're going to come over, put all their streaming services in, which is going to include lots of boxing. And they're going to do that for one ninety nine a month. Now, we know the one ninety nine a month won't stay, but, you know, it'll encourage a lot of people onto the platform. That's going to be an interesting clash as well, because Eddie Hearn works a lot with the zone in the States. And, uh, you know, he obviously looks like he's going to be working with Canelo for the next few fights if the last fight is anything to go by uh, and the sounds that came out of that. So with the zone over here in the UK and Eddie in bed with Sky in the UK long term, um, you know, how's that going to affect things? I think Eddie's going to have to make a hard choice and decide which way to jump. And so where's the money going to be? I don't know. But, you know, so there's going to be some interesting developments, um, you know, next year. And I think, you know, the future is going to be a rough few months. 
But I think the future is bright for boxing in 2021. I can't wait to review 2021 because honestly, you know, when I started making notes about this, I thought, how do you review 2020 without saying it was a disaster? We want to get rid of this year. We hate it. You know, that's that's the, the general feel. But actually, I looked through the list of fights. You know, I looked through, you know, um, you know what what had happened. I looked through the rise of women's box and I looked through the 50. And I thought, this is you know, there's a lot to talk about. Here. There's a lot of positive stuff. You know, one of the things I was doing when I was looking through, I was looking through as well at punch of the year. And I was thinking, I was thinking, that's got to be Povetkin against White. That left uppercut, as we said, as talked about earlier. But do you know what? There was a rival for that. When I was actually looking at these fights, these great 50-50 fights that came across, Javonta Davis against Leo Santa Cruz. Now that was a great fight. And it was it was a real, you know, it was a real humding. And then all of a sudden, Javonta Davis comes up with this amazing left uppercut, you know, which came out of nowhere. It wasn't as clinical, precise, and short as Povetkin's. It was more sort of came out, came in, came up, you know, found a gap in the guard. Um, but it was an amazing. So there, there's two punches of the year and they were both left uppercuts, funnily enough. So I think we're going to have a new category, left uppercut of the year. Maybe we'll introduce that next year and see, see, see who can get it. But yeah, overall, Peter, you know, I think there were, there, there were loads of positive things. Uh, like I say, a highlight fight of the year for me was Eggings and Cheese. But performance of the year was was uh, probably Tefimio Lopez. British fight of the year and performance of the year was undoubtedly Tyson Fury. Um, you know, and, and obviously Joshua rounded off the year with a, with, a, with a decent win against Pulev as well. And we saw the crowd start to come back. So, you know, I think the future's bright. The light is at the end of the tunnel and we're getting there. 2021 is going to be a brilliant year. And do you know what? 2020 wasn't all that bad considering. So we sign out and we look forward. It's going to be a great year. Cheers, Peter.